Good morning. You are heroes to be so early on a Saturday morning here, sitting in this audience. And um, you might ask yourself, what is a neuroscientist and psychologist doing here, right? What is she doing in a social entrepreneur um, uh, summit? And I hope that I can show you that perhaps psychologists in neuroscience can give a little bit of insight to economy and to, and to social entrepreneurship in terms of our thinking. So what I want to do is to introduce you into what we have called the framework of caring economics. And then I want to make the bridge because my speciality is inner work, is mental training, is how can you actually become a more caring, compassionate and empathic person? Because it's not obvious that you are already born like that, right? I mean, you are, but you can also do something about it. So I will do this bridge from inner work to societal transformation, I will try, right? And so I will talk about what is empathy and perspective taking and compassion in the brain and in the human and how can you train that? And why does that actually increase social cohesion, cooperation, for social behaviors? So everything which economy is about, right? <laughs> it's like about us cooperating in a global market. And then I conclude how that could uh, be relevant for you guys. So let me start with the caring economics framework. So how did that start? I moved um, as a neuroscientist and, and psychologist working on empathy, compassion, and became an economy professor in Zurich. And that was a bit strange because we wanted, in a very interdisciplinary research program, we wanted to understand the, the foundations of cooperation. When does it break down? How, do, how can you foster it? So we were psychologists, anthropologists, economists, but I was professor in the economy department. So I had to learn economy, right? And I was totally stunned. I was like, uh, Ernst Fair, he's a microeconomist, so behavioral economist. And then I worked many years with a macroeconomist, Professor Dennis Snor, and he explained macroeconomic model to me. So, and what I was lacking is, where is reality in that? <laughs> where is what we know about psychology? Where is what we know about human motivation? So what, what we tried in our cooperation over years is to bring psychology and neuroscience and behavioral economics together to form new models, right, which are informed by what we humans actually do. Um, so that is what I learned. I mean, it's a very, for the economist, and you don't stone me, it's a very simplistic model of decision making, but it is actually what you can still read in textbooks, in economic textbooks. So you have this, what economists call preferences. They are like endogenously given, they are fixed, they are not sensitive from context, and they cannot really change. So it's what we psychologists call traits. It's like enduring characteristic. That doesn't really make sense at all because we are extremely plastic individuals, right? So, oh, and then you have, so you have choices, and then you have these funny beliefs. These are these abstract beliefs which you, which you can only update if you see someone doing actions, right? For us social neuroscientists, this is totally surreal because we gain every millisecond information about the emotions and thinking of others all the time unconsciously. We don't have to see your behavior to know something about you, right? So, uh, so I just give you some data. I hope to show that this is all very strange for us, right? So we, that's also a very simple model, but we have to start somewhere, right? So we have in psychology a lot of different contexts which changes all the time, right? When I'm at home with my kids and then I go into whatever, like the stock market in New York, it's a totally different context, right? So this context will activate different motivational system in us. And these motivational system, they are very old. They are evolutionary, built into our body and, and mind, like system. Uh, and depending on which motivation will be active, we will have a different decision, yeah? The same person. Um, so, what do we know of motivation system? There are many, <laughs> there's a huge debate how many there are. I brought you seven, 
because they are very important for economic theory and decision making. But it's not all, no? It's not like we only have seven. So there is a class we call incentive focused. And incentive focus is like drive, is like wanting, you know? It's like, it's like achievement, no? I want to excel. We wouldn't have the Olympics without this motivation, right? You want to be better. You want to become even better than yesterday. We wouldn't have culture. We wouldn't have out cuisine and all that stuff without achievement motivation. So no motivation is bad in itself. It has a function in a niche. Consumption, I think economists know that by heart, right? Because your utility function is based on consumption. It's like wanting, buying, consuming. And power is known by economists as well, and you could just call it status. Um, so it's like ranking. You want to be on a higher rank than the other, right? Um, now, that's a system I think everyone familiar to, because we share that also with animals. When we are under threat, you know, it's flight, fight, or freeze. We, we, and so in, let's say, human emotion, we call it anger, because it's like approaching threat by being angry, or fear, which is avoiding threat by fleeing, right? And when you freeze, this is a human reaction which you call trauma. <laughs> so in trauma, we have frozen. And it's a whole other lecture. <laughs> now, these motives, the socially motive, they are as old, as important, and we share them as much with our animals, right? They are not something like only women and only fluffy, fluffy. No, they are like core motivation of our human race and animals. Now, the super important difference between affiliation and care is that affiliation is the motivation that you want to belong to a group. No, you want to, to belong to an in-group. You want to have an identity. And I think economists have started uh, to talk about identity theory, right? Psychologists know about identity theory since many, 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 many decades because we cannot just say we are individual being. We, we are extremely prone to affiliate. That means we also are afraid of being excluded and not liked and not belonging. And this, is, this motivation is driving norm behavior. You know, why are we following norms? Because we want to belong to a group, right? A society. Care is very altruistic. Care is really, I want the benefit of you, of the other, is in my focus. It's not about me being liked. Affiliation is I want to be liked by the group. It's quite egoistic in a way. Care is all about the other. It's really about I want your welfare. It's coming out of the, of the system of, of you know, mother-child or father-child bonding, of course, but it's, of course, much broader. And usually, this motivation needs to be in balance to be in a healthy body, in a healthy system. So what happens if you are constantly in incentive-focused motivation? And that's what's happening in our new modern systems we have built, right? Science is based on achievement only, education more or less. <laughs> uh, economy is built on consumption, a lot on power too. Um, even our health care system is not built on care. It's built on the left side, on the incentive, even though there is the word care in the system, healthcare. So we, have a, we are out of balance in the individual and as a macroscopic uh, society, right? We are all about incentive-focused motivation. So what happens is that even though these motivations are good when they are not chronically activated, they have their, their reason to be there, um, when you chronically activate them, you get into addiction. And, and you know addiction, cell phone addiction, internet addiction, food addiction, obesity. So we have huge amount of stress-related diseases and other diseases gramping because of addiction problem in our modern society. And that's because we are too much in this system of incentive focused. Then the threat system is like a twin to this hyperactive incentive system. Because imagine if you always want to be the best and always win, and when you have accumulated status, you don't want to lose it anymore. The ego, the, you, yourself, is constantly under threat to lose, not to be the best, 
not to keep the money they have gone. So the threat system is constantly activated because you could, you know, you could, <laughs> you know, lose what you just got. So they are like speaking a lot, and this is why we have an increase in social stress, not just already in very young populations. We have a huge amount of depression in young people at the moment. Um, so what about these other systems? <laughs> Biologically speaking, these systems, they are soothing, it's um, trusting, they connect you, they calm you down. They are biologically balancing. You know, the one is sympathetic and the other is parasympathetic. So biologically speaking, the socially and caring system come with opiates, with oxytocin. So these are hormones which will allow your system to calm down or to trust or uh, not, so when the threat system, you all know, no, is hyperactivated, you have constant cortisol flooding your body and your system. And then at, at some point, you are burned out, right? <laughs> you are depressed, burned out, and unhealthy. And the good thing is when you activate care, you have a direct inhibition of threat. We call that, you know, oxytocin is anxiolytic. It, and uh, opiates, you know, opiate epidemies also in America at the moment. Why do you give opiates? Because it's killing your pain and your suffering. So these care system, they endogenously activate opiate system and reduce your fear and let you feel better. So of course, we cannot build an economy on some drugs which activate oxytocin or so. That's not what I'm meaning. So what we said, is look, we have to rewrite the economic models, first also mathematically, by, you know, instead of just having this one, uh, I think it works like that, no? You see this utility function is the one you see in your textbooks, in the neoclassicistic decision-making textbooks model. And, and, but when you take a more complex view, you have all these other utility function which needs to be imputed. So if you are in care, you will have prosocial behavior, not egoistic behavior coming out. If you are in affiliation, you will probably more like conform and be normative. If you are in power, you will probably compete. So you have these different types of decisions um, which will come out depending on what is active and in which context you are. And so we have to rewrite our mathematical economic model, but that's complex because every context shifts all the time, right? So it's a dynamic system, and I don't think mathematicians are up to that yet. So it will be difficult to put math on that, right? But what I want to say is, if you are in a caring institution with an institutional design which allows to prime this care system, you will see post social behavior. And if you are in a system which is all about competition, you will see punishment behavior or competitive behavior. And we actually proved that in the lab. No? We took the economic games, game theory paradigm, which you use, no? like the whole uh, micro uh, behavioral economics tool set. But what we did is we used a little trick in psychology which is called priming. So we, one group was primed to activate the care system, but they didn't know that. And you do that by showing movies of little, you know, doggy puppets and so big little animals with big, big eyes and so on. And, and you have a cover story. So the people don't know that what is happening is that the care system gets activated. And then the other group gets power motivation activated through priming. And then you put them into this uh, economic decision-making task, and you can measure how much cooperation and how much competition comes out. And what you can prove is that, indeed, when you prime care, same people, you have much more cooperative behavior, much more trusting, much more donations than if you prime power. If you prime power, you see a lot of these altruistic punishment and conflicting behavior in these games. And you see that this conflicting behavior is even inhibited when you prime care, by, as, according to comparison to bear's line. So just sharing how wrong these 
classic model are who say we have preferences and they cannot shift. They can shift unconsciously in milliseconds in the same individual. Um, so now we want to really have something sustainable. Now we know that through massage you can activate oxytocin and care and soothing. No? And if you see them, you are like, ah, oh, just so good. No? But we cannot build an economy on massage. So our question was, can we actually educate people uh, to become more caring and more sustainable on the long term, more conscious about their intentions and what really matters in life? And so that is, of course, my passion as a psychologist and neuroscientist. It's really where I'm coming from, right? I'm not coming from, uh, from economy, surely. Um, we did a one-year mental training study because I said, OK, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not an economist. I can't change institutional design. I can't change. I don't like nudging at all, because that's not really, it works. But it's like priming. It's, it's not taking a person really seriously as a conscious agent. So I don't like nudging personally as a, as a tool. Um, so I said, why can we not change with inner change? Because inner change, you can start every minute. And you don't have to wait for politician or institution to change, right? You can do it in yourself. It's your responsibility. And can we address global problems, right? Because if we have climate change, I mean, you know, my colleagues who are climate researchers, they know since decades that we are running in problems, right? But nobody doing anything. Nobody changing. Why? Because you have to change your habits. You have to change your decisions every day. And you cannot change your habits and decisions if you don't change your motivation system and get control over it, right? So we have to, if we really want to have a massive global shift into climate care, we need to have care first in the motivation. No, if we have an egoistic system all the time around us, which always primes us in egoistic behavior, we will never ever have a caring <laughs> uh, daily behavior. And I, I mean, uh, sorry, of course, what uh, I already said, right? We have a, we always talk about this virus epidemic, but in the back, <laughs> there is something coming. I can tell you this will be much bigger mental health crisis in a big, big way. We have already before Corona, the 18 to 25 years young people who were always the most social and connected in, you know, when you are 18 to 25, you go out, they are the most loneliest cohort, given all the meta-analysis in Europe, in Japan, and in America. It's not the 80 plus white, right? and this is subjective loneliness, they feel disconnected, and that comes with depression, with suicide rate, ramping in with 15 years also. There is a real problem, and we can't close our eyes anymore, right? We have to do something about it. And through Corona, it exacerbated. We have just collected data. It's just much bigger. So can we do something <laughs> as psychologists, as individuals? So can we improve social intelligence? Can we improve global cooperation, uh, sustainable responsibility, you know, but from within, not from the head? So this is the resource project. It is a it's basically a, a, a life project because it started in 2008 and we are still publishing on nine terabyte data. So we have followed 300 individuals through a nine months mental training program. And in the first, um, in the first three months, you see presence. This is a module where you first teach people how to actually do mental training. It's, it's you know, a, in, informed by mindfulness approaches, but very secular mindfulness approaches coming from the East and from the West. And so you are stabilizing attention, stabilizing the mind. You are teaching people how to go from outwards to inwards, so to, to get to know your mind better. And then the WET module, the, so that's the attention mindfulness module, and the WET one, that's where we train care and compassion, right? This is why it's WED. It's like the heart, no? We open the heart. We train caring motivation through a lot of different exercises. And then the third one, uh, this perspective module, this is we teach people how to take more cognitive, reflective 
perspective taking. So how can you better understand that other people have different beliefs than yours, that other people think differently, that they come from different cultures, that they might have totally different beliefs, which then influence the action. No? Um, so that's, um, and why do we separate these, these modules? Uh, okay, then we had lots, lots of teachers and we had an app so that everyone could in their daily life do the mental training every day. So we had uh, exercises you do alone, uh, and then you had these, what we call diets. And these are 12 minutes partner exercise through an app. So you train empathic listening, compassion, perspective taking with a real other, not like imagine it, but a real other person over weeks. So we train these different capacity with different exercises. I'm not going into these exercises. We have time later. If people are really interested in what we did, <laughs> you can stay and we can discuss you know, what, what exercises are these and so on. So I'm just uh, telling you perhaps one thing which I think is really important. Um, in these diets, you really train empathic listening, not judging others. What is 10? OK, so, thank you. And coping better with stress, coping with difficult emotion, regulating your emotion, gratitude, and so on. And I think to make a complex story short, we could show that these 10 minutes exercise bring people out of loneliness. So they reconnect people. They, when you ask them how close do you feel connected to the other, before and after this exercise, you see you feel much more connected. And what the interesting thing is, you don't only feel more connected to the person you did the exercise with. Every week before the exercise even starts, you feel more connected to the world, to people you don't even know. So we could, in a way, you know, really increase um, shared humanity, interconnectedness, and closeness. OK, so what I now, very short because it's rather complex, but why you know, do we differentiate between these modules, between compassion and care-based and perspective-taking? And why we do that is because we know from social neuroscience that our brain has different pathways to support the ability to feel with someone. So empathy is the ability to resonate with feelings with someone. And compassion is also a feeling, is like a concern, love for the other. Um, and theory of mind is cognitive, is, is a rational abstraction we can do about, oh, the other has other, different beliefs, right? Religious beliefs and, and so on. So um, why do we need both? Empathy and compassion motivates us to help, right? This is the motivational aspect. This is the heart. And then we want to help because we care. We feel the pain of the other. But this is not enough to move into global compassion and care. Because empathy and compassion can be fragile in the moment you're dealing with outgroup members. In the moment where you're dealing with people you dislike, they have hurt you, their other religion, other belief system. And to basically include people from other identities, outgroup people, you need this cognitive perspective taking, this wisdom. You need to be able to creep into the mind of another who thinks and feels totally different, has been raised differently, different ages. Um, and we can scan. We can make brain scans. And what you see is that, indeed, you see these networks in green. Obviously, now the networks in the brain are not green. Uh, I just colored them here for the purpose of the talk so that you can understand that these networks in the brain, large-scale networks, which underlie our ability to, you know, to, to mind read, to take this cognitive perspective, are totally different networks than the networks in the brain which are supporting empathy and compassion, social, emotional motivation. And because they are different, we can train them differently, right? You know, I think um, everyone understands why, you know, like if, if journalists came and said, Tanya, what is the, what is the effect of mental training? I said, it's almost like you're asking a sports specialist, what are the effects of sports? 
I mean, you will ask, now, is it riding? Is the tennis playing? You know, when I'm in a fitness center and I'm, I'm taking, you know, a, a machine to increase my muscles here, I'm not expecting that my leg muscles get stronger, right? And the same thing is for the mind. So if you do exercises to open care, empathy, compassion, loving kindness, you will find different results than if you do attention mental training and so on. And this is what we find. So here are the results. Uh, the brain of these people training get thicker, really like hardware get thicker, after three months of attention mindfulness-based training and attention increases. But you see here, after three months of compassion-based training, you don't see any attention, but you see compassion increasing, but not the other things, right? It's very special. And then after three months yeah, <laughs> of this perspective-taking training, you see these gray matter increases here in the brain, in green here, which are the network supporting this ability. And that's all in the same brain, right? So you can imagine it's really like fitness, but it's gray matter thickness in your brain, getting thicker. And that was quite revolutionary because I was told with 25, your brain gets thinner and you just get Alzheimer at some point and you just have atrophy, right? And these are like 43 on average people, it's not very young. And they can increase gray matter through a mini training, not a lot at a day, right? This is a real yes you can thing. Okay, then for the time being short, we could reduce social stress um, to 51%. So if we measure cortisol in our blood as a response to a social stressor, we can reduce, you see that here, with these diets, so only in the social modules, so only in the modules where you train social skills with another person every day, you can reduce the social stress to 51%. And this is because, we, because they learn first not to judge others all the time, not to judge themselves all the time, and just start loving themselves, right? And then you don't have this social stress anymore. Uh, for you guys, mostly probably interesting, um, we have used this game theoretical paradigm. No? I have learned in an economic faculty. So we have used 14 different of these game theoretical paradigm where you really play for real money. And guess which module was the most efficient? According to economic theory, it should be the perspective taking, the rational one the one where you, where you train rational thinking and perspective taking. It did not do a thing. The only module which was really efficient in driving donation, trust, altruism, was the care-based module, the emotional one. And economists don't like to hear that because emotions are rather thought of something hindering a rational decision and not giving something good, right? But no, the care system is not just a fleeting emotion which is in the way, it's a survival motivation, right? It's important for evolution as much as all the other system. And that's the one which drives altruism and cooperation most. Um, so I think, I hope that I could tell you that we can actually do something to become another being. <laughs> so the preference model, which is fixed, is totally wrong. We can show that we can turn so-called egoist in 30, I mean days, through exercising 10 minutes a day or 20, into altruist, right? With the same game, the very same game the economists used to prove their models. <laughs> And so I guess this needs to be taken seriously because it just means these models are wrong. Um, this is why we do empirical research. And I hope that I could show you, depending on how, what we do with our mind every day, we will train different aspects of our mind, of the heart and the body, right? We, but we can teach it and it changes even the structure of our brain. So we have brain plasticity and we can decrease stress increase a lot of other things like body awareness. So 
you know, instead of giving oxytocin spray or massage to everyone, uh, which is not a, a realistic um, opportunity, you know, I would say we could show that you can induce care by yourself by basically becoming a conscious agent. Uh, and then you could shift society in a big, big way. So I would say instead of only focusing, I'm not saying either or, but instead of only focusing on changing institutional design and law, we should focus in parallel together on also educating children, especially in schools already, to become master of their own mind and hearts and to, become, to have an ethical education. So what we are doing now is, and this is where I become an entrepreneur, I'm working with a lot of startups together and advising them and so on to bring these practices into education, into, um, into business, into healthcare. I just finished a masterclass with real exercise and three-day retreat, um, and we are just doing a COVID study. Uh, it started basically just with um, you know, tracking 4,000 Berliners with an app during COVID time and asking them about vulnerability, mental health, social cohesion, uh, and well-being. And to give something back, we are now training a subsample of these Berliners in these diets, in these mental training online through the app to see whether we can help reduce the stress and the loneliness which COVID has created, right, the pandemic. So that's a study which is ongoing. We will have a, a brochure out of this mental health study, which will show already descriptive results. And then if you want to learn yourself um, these practices and get an insight of how that works, these secular practice, we also, the next masterclass is in March next, next year. Not, not many places left anymore, but we are trying to bring that in the practical world, right? Because speaking about this is one thing and then practicing it is the transformative thing, is the thing which really makes the difference. Thank you.